Steel, USF, the industrial family that serves the nation, presents... The Hour of Mystery. Starring tonight, Florence Olivier. United States Steel Corporation, whose products, identified by the familiar USS label, serve you in your home, your business, and when you travel, invite you to listen to a full hour of mystery, intrigue, and adventure. The first in our series of 13 summer programs. Our story tonight is Journey into Fear by Eric Ambler. Our star is the distinguished English actor of stage and screen, now appearing in New York with London's Old Vic Theatre Company, Lawrence Olivier. Lawrence Olivier as David Graham in Journey to Fear. I won't. I won't. Listen to me, stupid one. We're not the local police of Gallipoli. We're the Turkish secret police. You've been caught with a knife and two guns in the company of a known murderer. Look around at us. There isn't a chance. You will have to tell us. You were hired to kill somebody. Who was it? Tell us. I'll tell. Quickly, then. Who was it you were going to kill? The Englishman, David Graham. I am David Graham. Shortly after the war started in 1939, my company sent me to Gallipoli on a business trip. I worked hard in Gallipoli for three months, but it was very dull there. It was so dull that I took to imagining things. I thought for a while that a man was following me because for three days, wherever I went, I caught sight of that same little man with an evil ferret's face. But, of course, this must have been all in my mind. Because after a while, I didn't see that man anymore. Finally, my work was done, and I was going home. I went to Istanbul, where I had to wait one night for a train. I dined with Mr. Kopaikin, our Istanbul representative. And after dinner, invited him to my hotel room for a drink. (laughs) I'm glad you asked me. I can use the drink, Graham. Fine. And then, of course, knowing that you're in your room, I'd be sure you're safe. <laughs> you're rather an old woman about my safety, Papa. Uh, well, you're a valuable man, Graham. No, but Here we are. Graham. Wait, wait. Do you hear any noise inside? Of course not. Be careful. Be careful. I think someone is in your room. I've got into you. Here, let's go in. Come no. on, no, no, Graham. No. Listen to me. You'll have to open the door, but... He bent over to the side. Don't find yourself in the doorway. Kopakin, old man, you've got a bad case of nerves. Here. You grim! You grim! Ow! Grim! Turn on the light. Get to the window. Catch it. Stop! 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 There's no use, Grim. He's gone. Get a little rest. All right. All right. The door. Wait a moment. Wait. Keep it here. Now, lucky for me, you did hear that noise in here, Kopakin. Are you all right, Grim? Oh, yes. Stop me in the hand. Thank you very much. Now, come, let me bandage it. Come. Thanks. Here, this, this handkerchief will, will do. Oh, that's not too nasty. Mm-hmm. I should thank you, Kopakin. You probably saved my life. Well, I uh, said you're a very valuable man, Graham. Does it hurt? Hmm? No. Oh, there. No, I think it's all right. That feels fine. Thanks. I don't think he got away with anything. Oh, I'm sure he didn't. The bags are still locked. There was nothing much. Hey, wait a minute, Kopakin. Why are you sure he didn't get anything? Never mind. You've been hinting mysterious things all evening. Kopakin, did you really hear a sound in here, or did you just know somebody was waiting? Never mind. All right, maybe I'm imagining things now. 
At any rate, I'd better telephone the management. No. Why not? I'm afraid they reported to the Istanbul police. What are you talking about? That's just what I want them to do. I want that dirty little thief called. The city police must know nothing of this. Why not? This is a case for the secret police. Secret police? Exactly. Come here. Come. Look out the window. See? The man climbed up a steel framework from the terrace. He could have got any other room on this floor by the same method. Why did he pick yours? I suppose he had to pick somebody. The lock on your window was forced. It's hot tonight. Almost all the other windows are open. Why would a mere burglar select a window that was locked? Don't ask me why a burglar does anything. It wasn't a burglar. That's why I'm going to call the secret police. Get me his molly. I three two. Hello? Colonel Hockey, please. Hello? Colonel Hockey? Go fight me. Y- yes, yes. Yes, just as we feel. Someone shot Graham. No, no, he is not seriously hurt. No, no. Room 261, Grand Hotel Terrace. Yes, yes, I'll stay with him until you get here, yes. If I can, will you tell me what all this melodrama means? It's time you were told. The man that you call a burglar came here for no other purpose than to kill you. Graham, there is a plot against your life. Mr. Graham, stop pacing. Sit down and listen to me. All right, Colonel Harkey. I have listened to you, and I've listened to Kopaikin before you came. And all I know is that you think this burglar came here to kill me. You ought to think so by now, Mr. Graham. You're in the employ of Messrs. Cater and Bliss Limited, the English armament manufacturers. Yes, I'm a naval ordnance engineer. I know it. And I also know that certain of our naval vessels are to be rearmed with new guns and torpedo tubes. And that is why you're in Turkey. That's correct. All right. Now, let us suppose that you'd been killed tonight. What would be the effect on this business that you're engaged in? The whole project would be delayed. How long? Oh, I see what you're driving at. I'm an engineer. I'm afraid I've never thought about things like this. But I get it now. Yeah. I was told to put nothing on paper. It's all in my head. And if you were killed? Yeah. Yeah, I see. Spring would come and the ships of the Turkish Navy would still be lying in the dockyards of Izmir and Gallipoli waiting for their new guns and torpedo tubes. Yeah, I, I see. I thought you would. And wouldn't the enemies of Great Britain and Turkey be pleased with a delay in our naval program? You mean a German agent is trying to kill me? The whole network of German agents in the Near East is concentrating very, very hard on just that problem, Mr. Graham. I scarcely believe that. It is true, Mr. Graham. The head of the German spy system in this region is Stefan Müller. For some time, Müller has been trying hard to have you killed. Do you, uh, do you realize we foiled one attempt on your life in Gallipoli? What? Yes, yes. But that's all past now. Now we've got to foil this new attempt. Yeah. How? Muller has hired a man named Banner. Peter Banner. Say that name, Graham. Peter Banner. Don't forget it. Peter Banner is a professional killer. He's been hired to kill you. Is that who was in this room tonight? Must have been. Did you see him? No. Oh. It's too bad. Uh, Colonel Harkey. Yes? Uh, look, um... I'm no hero. I'd, I'd like the police to protect me, because even if I could recognize Banner, I wouldn't know how to cope with him. I'll need protection only overnight. I'm leaving on the 11 o'clock train tomorrow. No, you're not. My dear sir, I said I'm leaving on the 11 o'clock train tomorrow. No, Mr. Graham, you're leaving on a small cargo ship going to Genoa. Colonel Harkey, no. A train is faster, and I want to leave this country as fast as possible. If you boarded the train, you would be dead before you reached Belgrade. How about a plane? You'd be shot down as soon as you crossed the border. Mr. Graham, if you do not agree to travel on the cargo ship... I shall protect my country and yours by arresting you, issuing an order for your deportation, and putting you on board that ship anyhow. I hope I make myself clear. Quite clear. Fine. You see, Mr. Graham, I'll be able to check the list of passengers very carefully. You will probably be very safe on that ship. All right, I, I agree. But now let me tell you something. I'm in danger. I've been shot at. A large number of complete strangers are apparently anxious to kill me. I refuse to be passive, Colonel Harkey. I refuse to stand like a tall and stoop-shouldered target for a gang of cutthroats. You're making the arrangements, I accept that. But I insist on one thing. You've got to give me a gun.
I boarded the ship the next afternoon. As I walked up the gangplank, I could feel things. Bullets, knives in my back. I hadn't slept. I hadn't turned the light out all night. And now as I stepped from the gangplank to the deck of that miserable little ship, I felt alone and alert. I was a traveler embarking on a journey into fear. Hello, monsieur. What? Oh, startled me. I didn't mean to frighten you, but we are to travel together. I feel we should know each other. My name is José. Maybe you have seen me dancing at the turquoise. Oh, no, sorry. Your name is David Graham, is it not? How do you know that? Don't you suppose a girl has ways of finding these things out, Monsieur Graham? Perhaps, but I'd like to know how. Does it matter? To me, a great deal. Can't you accept me as I am without explanation? At the moment, I'm afraid I can't accept anyone without explanation. You sound mysterious, my friend. I'm not your friend. I hope you will be. How did you find out my name? Did someone tell you? You seem alone, Monsieur Graham. Well, who told you my name? Who was it? Is it a passenger? Monsieur Graham, please. I read the passenger list. You are English. And the only English name on the passenger list is Graham. Oh, heavens, is that all? <laughs> but of course. Well, why pick on me? Why not one of the other passengers? Because Englishmen have more money, Monsieur Graham. Oh, you've come to the wrong Englishman. I don't think so. Oh, all right, so I'm a millionaire. What are you going to do with all my millions once you wheedle them out of me? Maybe if you spend a little bit on two drinks, Monsieur Graham, we can discuss that. <laughs> all right, you're on. Give me five minutes to find my state, uh, state room and wash up, and I'll meet you in the ship's bar. All right. But don't forget your wallet, Monsieur Graham. <laughs> the first time I'd laughed since Banner had shot at me in the hotel room. Josette had the hard little body and the wise young face of the professional dancer. And I, I've always had the normal emotions of the average male. I hurried to my stateroom, washed up, was about to leave for the ship's bar when I noticed an envelope fastened to my pillow slip. Mr. Graham, I have checked the passenger list. So far as I can tell, all the passengers are innocent. But we should not underestimate Stefan Muller. Make friends with no one, particularly those who seem anxious for your friendship. Signed, Colonel Harkin. Stuart, oh, Stuart. Yes, sir? Uh, please have all my meals sent to the stateroom. All of them, sir? Yeah, all of them. I will not be leaving here, not for the entire voyage. Very good, sir. And Stuart... Uh, yes, sir? When you bring my meals, knock three times, then once. What is that, sir? Knock three times, then once, like this. Uh, yes, sir. It was not the signal I'd arranged for the steward. I sat on the edge of my bunk. My hands gripping the spread, and my eyes staring at the door. Was it Peter Banner? Was it Josette? I took a quiet step toward my suitcase where my gun was. But then I heard a key inserted in the lock. Heard it slowly turning. How do you do? Who are you? My name is Kuvetli. What are you doing in my stateroom? Please, this is my stateroom. It is mine. Oh, please, it is a double stateroom. It is uh, yours and mine. Oh, there's some mistake here. Colonel Hawk, uh, a friend of mine gave me to understand that I'd be here alone. I'm sorry, I have some influence. An official of the shipping lines arranged for me to occupy this stateroom. You'll have to find another one. Oh, please. I understand there is no other one, Mr. Graham. I suppose your influential friend gave you my name, too. Naturally. Well, if you'll excuse me, Mr. Cuvetto. Oh, I... I do not want to drive you away. You're not. I'm going to the dining saloon for dinner. Mr. 
Graham, wouldn't you like to sit at table with some of the other passengers? Uh, no, thank you. Wait, I prefer to be alone. Oh, very good, sir. How do you do, Mr. Graham? Uh, oh, oh, usual, sir. You did not come to the bar as you promised, monsieur. Uh, no, I, uh, I was delayed. <laughs> and if I give you, may I sit here? Uh, why, I'm... I'm, I'm sorry. Um, as a matter of fact, I was just telling the waiter to bring my meal to that table over there. That man sitting alone, he's a friend of mine. What's his name? Don't tell me you didn't see his name on the passenger list, is that? If you'll pardon me, uh... How do you do, sir? How do you do? My name is Graham. May I sit here? You may, Mr. Graham, but uh, perhaps you will not want to. Oh, why not? My name is Haller, Dr. Fritz Haller. I am a German, a good German. And perhaps you, a good Englishman, would not wish to sit with me. Oh, not at all, if you don't mind. Fine, Mr. Graham. Perhaps I am not as patriotic as I should be. I do not feel that because our countries are at war, we should insult each other. No, I agree with you. Have you been long in the Near East, Mr. Graham? Three months. And you? Three years. I am an archaeologist. Are you interested in archaeology, Mr. Graham? I don't know much about it. I was investigating the early pre-Islamic cultures... I found that some of the tribes that moved westward 4,000 years ago preserved Sumerian culture almost intact until long after the fall of Babylon. Oh, indeed. May I sit here? How do you do, sir? Uh, sit down, of course. My name is Haller, and uh, this is Mr. Graham. Uh, my name is Kuvetli. Mr. Graham and I have met. We are sharing a stateroom. Not so, Mr. Graham. It would seem so. Mr. Graham and I were talking about archaeology. Oh, I know nothing about archaeology. I... I am only a tobacco salesman. Really? What company? Uh, Pazar and Company. But I should be most interested to hear about archaeology. I was telling Mr. Grain about some of the tribes who lived on the plains of Iran. The form of the perpetuation of the Adonis myth alone was instructive to me. The weeping for Thomas was always a focal point in the previous morning. Haller talked throughout the meal. It was a monumental ball. But I was grateful to him for talking, for I could not have said one coherent thing myself. Cuvetless... Jubetler kept staring at me with a smile that my own numb, frightened face could not answer. And when finally the meal was finished, oh, I could gracefully leave. The Aeneas personified by three different races. The Sumerians called uh, the gods. Pardon me, gentlemen. You but, are uh, leaving, Mr. Yes. Graham? Yeah. Please, we should go to our stateroom together. Oh, I'm sorry, but as a matter of fact, Dr. Hallop promised that after dinner he'd tell me something interesting about the connection between my business and archaeology. Uh, didn't you, Dr. Hallop? What? Well, yes. Yes, of course. If you're quite ready, then we could take a turn about the deck. Why, well, well, of course. Uh, you will excuse us, Mr. Gubertley. Oh, certainly. I will see you later, Mr. Graff. Mr. Graham, you lied to Mr. Gubertley. You made me lie to him. I really don't understand. I'm terribly sorry, Dr. Haller, but I simply do not like the man. I, I wanted to be rid of him. He is peculiar. For one thing, he is capable of a lie himself. What do you mean? He said he was a tobacco salesman for Pizarre and Company. There is no such firm. Now, Mr. Graham, about the Sumerian epic. Dr. Haller and I took two turns around the deck, and then he retired. I could not bring myself to go to my stateroom, where Cubetli, or was his name, Banna, awaited me. I went to the lounge, but Josette was there. Before she saw me, I backed away and returned to the deck. I walked around and around for hours. The wind rose and the water lapped against the side of the little vessel. And still I did not dare return to my stateroom. If I went there and grew tired, so that my eyes closed against my will, I might never open them. I paced the deck until nearly dawn. Twice I thought I heard someone behind me, but when I turned, there was no one there. Finally, I went wearily down the companionway and across the corridor to my stateroom door. As I fumbled for my key... Please. Oh, uh, let, let, me. let me use my key, Mr. Grant. <laughs> we both walk all night, eh? Sleep. I lay for hours listening to the snores of Mr. Cuvetli. The ship docked at Athens, and still I lay there while Cuvetli rose and dressed. I am going to visit Athens today, 
Uh, please, uh, you will come with me, Mr. Graham? No, thank you. Very well. Goodbye, then. Then I slept. It was late in the day when I awoke. As I was dressing, Cubetli returned from his trip to Athens. Well, Mr. Graham, you should have come with me. Athens is most education. Is that so? Yes. Uh, have you met the new passenger? No. No, I remained here in the stateroom all day. So? The new passenger came aboard sometime during the afternoon. His name is uh, Mivrodopoulos. Huh? And yet, <laughs> it is strange. What is? Uh, please, I, you must not think me fanciful, Mr. Graham. But I have the feeling I have met Mr. Mivrodopoulos before, and that then he did not call himself Mivrodopoulos. What did he call himself? Banna. Peter Banna. In a moment, we will return with the second act of Journey into Fear, sponsored by the United States Steel Corporation. And here speaking for United States Steel is George Hicks. Last Thursday, June 6th, was the second anniversary of D-Day, that never-to-be-forgotten June day in 1944, when the United States and Great Britain smashed ashore to speed the final defeat of Germany with the most powerful seaborne invasion ever attempted. I had the high honor of being an eyewitness to that gigantic history-making operation and of describing it over the transatlantic radio to American listeners. Tonight I have the equally high honor of being able to tell you about one man among the tens of thousands who took part in that D-Day operation, one man who is a symbol of the way our armed forces fought to safeguard our American way of living. This one man is Lester H. Bauman. He's 25 years old. He won the Purple Heart when he was wounded on D-Day off the Omaha beachhead there in Normandy. But after eight weeks in the hospital, he returned to the United States and went on to fight the Japs. Now he's back at work at the Cuyahoga Works of the American Steel and Wire Company, where he'd been employed before the war. Today, he's a foreman and happy in his job. A good example of the United States Steel Corporation's intensive program to provide worthwhile jobs to returning servicemen. Even while Lester Bauman was fighting, the United States Steel was planning ways in which men like Lester, and especially those veterans who are physically handicapped, would again take their places on peacetime production lines. In the United States Steel's family of 250,000 workers, some 45,000, one out of every five are returned servicemen. Those 45,000 jobs are U.S. Steel's way of keeping faith with the men who made our victory possible. We pause briefly for a station identification. You are listening to the Hour of Mystery, sponsored by the industrial family that serves the nation, United States Steel. The curtain rises on the second act of Eric Ambler's story, Journey into Fear, starring Laurence Olivier as David Graham. Did you ever perform a whole series of complex and purposeful movements without realizing what you were doing? I did. After Cupetti told me that Peter Banner, the man who had been hired to kill me, was with me on the ship, I pulled on my trousers, put on my socks and shoes, knotted the laces securely, put on my shirt, buttoned it, tied my tie, and put on my jacket. I know I must have done these things because suddenly I realized I was fully dressed. Cupetti was still talking to me. But I left the stateroom and went directly to the office of the purser. 
What do you do? Monsieur Graham, is it? Yes, I want to see the captain at once. For what reason, monsieur? It's absolutely necessary that I be put ashore immediately. Impossible, monsieur Graham. The pilot boat has gone. I know that, but the circumstances are exceptional, and I'm ready to pay for the loss of time and the inconvenience caused. But why? Are you ill? No, but I assure you my reasons are excellent. Uh, perhaps, monsieur. But we do not alter our schedule on the basis of mere assurances. Very well. Since you insist on details, I'll tell you. There's a man on this ship who is here for the express purpose of killing me. Indeed, monsieur. And his name? Peter Banner. There is no one of that name on this ship, monsieur. Uh, he's traveling as Mivrodopoulos. Can you prove Mivrodopoulos is really Banner? Uh, if you radio Colonel Harkey of the Turkish secret police at Istanbul, he will confirm what I say. And uh, you think he would recognize the man at that distance, monsieur? Uh, this is no joking matter. I know what I'm talking about. Monsieur, how do you know? Do you know either Mivrodopoulos or Banner personally? No. Well, then, monsieur, you well, got it. That's why I hesitated. Mr. Kuvetle told me that Mivrodopoulos is Banner. But then Kuvetle may himself be Banner. In either case, I must be put ashore immediately. Monsieur Graham, do you realize how much you begin to sound like a man who has a bad dream? I tell you, my life is in danger. Or perhaps you have not had a bad dream, huh? Perhaps you have invented this story simply because, for some private reason, you wish to be put ashore. If that is true, I'm sorry. It is a ridiculous story. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have work to do. I demand. No, that you monsieur. Me I demand. I demand that you close the door as you leave. Bartender. Yes, Mr. Graham. Another whiskey and soda. Yes, sir. Well, Monsieur Graham, you even drink hello. Oh, hello, Josette. You got to join me. I'm not sure. You've been very rude to me, you know. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Won't you have a drink? Yes, thank you. Vermouth cassis. Vermouth cassis for the lady. Here, will you bring it to the little table over there in the corner? Yes, sir. Come, Jose. So, we're going to have a set up there. Oh, it'll be more comfortable. Voila. And now you tell me why you are so nervous. Nervous? Yes, Monsieur Graham. I have seen people who are afraid before. They have a special look about them. Their faces look very small and gray around the mouth. And they cannot keep their hands still. Do I look like that? Yes. And I wonder why. Josette, have you noticed the bandage on my hand? Of oh. I have a bullet wound there. You're joking. No. There are a number of people who, for, for business reason, reasons, wish me dead. One of them is on this ship. Who is he? His name is Peter Banner. Then he must be traveling under another name. Yes. Banner is one of those two. Monsieur Graham, you're not joking. No. And why do you trust me with this information? Trust is not exactly the word, Josette. If you are not in league with Banner and all the rest, it can do me no harm having you know. You are in league with them. I am not. If you are in league with them, you can tell them this from me. I'm through with waiting. Let them watch out for themselves. The ocean is as deep and cold for them as it is for me. That flesh is as yielding to the caress of a bullet as mine. Tell me Brodopolis that. Tell Cuvetli that. A waiter brought our drinks, and we talked politely after that. And even flirted a bit. But my mind was elsewhere. I was full of resentment and anger against the men who were waiting to strike me down in the dark. When we had finished our drinks, I excused myself and strode directly to my stateroom. Went in... I'd open the suitcase. Why the devil? Why the devil is it? The gun Colonel Hockey had given me was gone. You went to Athens this afternoon, Mr. Graham? No, Dr. Allen. I did. Your friend, Mr. Kuvetli, persuaded me. Is that so? Yes. He had never seen Athens. He hired a car. The chauffeur did the guiding. And since Mr. Kuvetli speaks fluent Greek, the whole thing went off quite satisfactorily. You say he speaks Greek? Yet has never been to Athens? Yes. You'd think he would have been, wouldn't you? However, we have... Excuse me. May I share this table? My name is Mivadopoulos. Oh, of course. I'm Dr. Haller, and this is Mr. Graham. Monsieur Graham. How do you do? I've traveled a long way today, from Salonika. That's strange. 
Ah? Uh-huh. What is strange about it, Mr. Graham? It seems to me, Mr. Milverdopoulos, that it's easier to travel from Salonica to Genoa by train. Some people don't like trains, Mr. Graham. And then some people have special missions on ships. Mm, perhaps. Back to Haller. You are a chairman? I am, but I hope, Mr. Milverdopoulos, that we will not get into a political argument. Ah, not at all. I like Germany. Germany and Italy. And what do you think about England? I agree with Dr. Haller. I do not like to get into a political argument. Uh, you have business in Genoa, Mr. Nidrodopoulos? Yes. I understand the thing to see in Genoa is the cemetery. Is that so? Hmm. Why? It's a very large cemetery, very well arranged, and planted with very fine cypresses. Perhaps I shall go there, then. Perhaps you shall, Mr. Nidrodopoulos. Perhaps you shall. Excuse me, Mr. Graham. Uh, I've been noticing the bandage on your hand. You, uh, you had an accident? This is a bullet wound, Mr. Milverdopoulos. Some dirty little thief took a shot at me in Istanbul. It was either a bad shot or frightened. He missed. A dirty little thief, eh? Hmm? Must look after yourself carefully, Mr. Graham. I'm perfectly well able to do that, Mr. Milverdopoulos. Is that so? And you're ready to shoot back next time. You carry a pistol? Um, you hesitate, my dear sir. Perhaps you do not carry a pistol. You should. A man in your position must be very, very careful, Mr. Graham. Josette. Oh, Monsieur Graham. I must talk to you. I am flattered. Perhaps you won't be. Remember what I told you this afternoon? I have been thinking of nothing else. I'm afraid for you, my friend. I said I didn't trust you. I know. I'm sorry. Well, I find I have to trust you now. What do you want me to do? Mirodopolis and Kubrekli are both in the lounge. I want you to see to it that they stay there. For how long? Give me an hour. What are you going to do? (sighs) Josette, I can't trust you that far. I understand. You'll hold them in the lounge anyway. Of course I will. Thank you, Josette. You're very good to me. I do not find you unattractive, Mr. Graham. Josette. Yes? Um, oh, um, nothing. This were only an ordinary voyage I'd done. Uh... Why don't you kiss me anyway, Mr. Uh, you know everything, don't you? Just that. There. It makes you feel better, yeah? Mm. Help. I'm glad. Now I go to the lounge and I keep those two men busy. Are you sure you can do it? Monsieur Gray, you just kissed me, and you can ask that. I did feel better. I trusted Josette, not because I had any reason to, but because I had to trust somebody. There was a little smile on her face as she turned from me, and she walked towards the lounge with the assured bearing of one about to perform a task at which she's expert. And I myself went to the opposite direction, quietly, unobtrusively, down the companionway and along the corridor to the stateroom occupied by Milverdopoulos. I knocked on the door. There was no answer. I turned the knob. The door was locked. From my pocket, I took a small metal bar and pushed it into the crack between the door and the frame. Threw my weight against it. I touched nothing at first. I looked at everything and found only two indications that the cabin was occupied. A battered gray raincoat hanging with a soft hat behind the door and a composition suitcase under the berth. I searched the pockets of the raincoat. There was nothing there. I tried the suitcase. It was unlocked. I opened it. Paper-covered novel, brightly colored silk handkerchiefs, a pair of black shoes without laces. Nothing else. Mephidopoulos was smarter than I was. He carried his gun with him. Well, there was still Cuvette's suitcase. I left the cabin and walked a short distance down the corridor to my own. I knew Cuvette kept his suitcase locked. I was glad of it. It meant there was a better chance that I might find a gun there. I got to my room and opened my door. How do you do, Mr. Gray? Why, Dr. Haller. I've been waiting for you. What are you doing in my room? Reading. Here's a book full of the dream-heavy classical soul. I recommend it to you, Mr. Gray. 
Uh, Dr. Hall, I don't quite understand. Of course not. I believe you've been looking for a gun. And here it is. Oh, no. I'm not handing it for you. Put up your hands, Mr. Graham. Stand perfectly still. In a moment, we will return with the third act of Journey Into Fear, sponsored by the United States Steel Corporation. And here again, speaking for United States Steel, is George Hicks. When I speak of the United States Steel Corporation, I frequently call it the industrial family that serves the nation. That's because that phrase describes pretty well the various companies which make up United States Steel. Their jobs range from mining iron ore to shipping products of finished steel to the ends of the earth. Working together, they supply thousands of American businesses with quality steel for countless products. In fact, the USS trademark has become famous all over the world as the mark of fine steel. That's why I say the United States Steel family serves the nation. To do these many jobs requires many hands, of course. The corporation is able to carry on its work only because of the skill and efforts of the 250,000 men and women of United States Steel. They are all vitally important members of the family. Naturally, the question arises as to who owns United States Steel, who employs all these Americans. The answer is many more Americans. For United States Steel is owned by almost a quarter of a million stockholders. People all over the country have invested their money in the ownership of the corporation. You yourself probably have an interest, either directly or because your insurance company, your hospital, or your local college may well own stock in United States Steel. The corporation which employs and serves so many Americans is itself owned by many Americans. Living up to its responsibilities to all three of these groups, the public, its employees and its owners, is the major job of the industrial family that serves the nation, United States Steel. The curtain rises on the third act of Eric Ambler's story, Journey into Fear, starring Laurence Olivier as David Graham. I stood still with my hands raised above my head and looked down past the barrel of the gun into the calm blue eyes of Dr. Haller. I had suspected everyone on the ship of wanting me dead except Dr. Haller. Here was a boresome German scientist, or so I'd thought. Now I had to adjust my mind to the fact that he was a dangerous spy bent on killing me. For a long time, neither of us spoke. Then... I think, Mr. Graham, that you may sit down now. No, it's ten, thank you. Very well. So you are Peter Banner. I thought from the way you talked to me, Rodopolis, tonight that you realized he is Banner. Oh, then I wonder if your name happens to be Muller. My goodness, I had no idea you were so well informed. Yes, my name is Muller. And I have business to discuss with you. Business? Yes. I like you, Mr. Graham. And yet I am compelled to be offensive. I must tell you that as things stand at present, you will be dead within a few minutes of your landing at Genoa tomorrow morning. How do you mean, as things stand at present? I mean, there is an alternative. I see. A lesser evil. Oh, scarcely an evil. A pleasant alternative. You see, Mr. Graham, I am lily-livered. I admit it freely. So I would like to settle this matter without bloodshed. So would I. You're something of a humorist, Mr. Graham. Now, the only reason we have been seeking your death is that we are interested in delaying the building of torpedo tubes for the Turkish Navy. Six weeks delay is all we shall need. And they're going to try to kidnap me for six weeks? I should say not. There would be inquiries. There would be investigation. You might be released. No, my proposition is quite a different one. Well, make it and get out of here. Suppose, Mr. Graham, that the moment you get ashore at Genoa, a mild attack of typhus should develop. You would be taken immediately to a private clinic where you would be the only patient. You would be attended by Drs. Merlin and Bernard. 
Your illness would last six weeks. You mean to say you'd let me go after six weeks? Why not? After all, Mr. Graham, you would scarcely dare to tell the truth once you had agreed to this proposition. Is that all you have to say? No. There is one other thing. Has Couvetli revealed himself to you? Revealed himself to me? I see that he has not. But let me inform you that Couvetli was planted on this ship, was planted in this stateroom with you by Colonel Hockey of the Turkish Secret Police. You're trying to tell me that Couvetli is a Turkish agent? Yes, and a very clever one. His duty is to see that you get into France in safety. I want to warn you against telling him of the suggestion I have made to you. What difference would it make? I have told you, Mr. Graham, that your only chance of remaining alive is to accept my little proposition. If you tell Covetly, naturally, I cannot go through with my part of the bargain. If you tell Covetly, you will destroy the only chance that remains to you of returning to England alive. <laughs> Mr. Grant. I've been waiting for you, Mr. Kubetli. Uh, thank you. I I might have retired sooner, but the dancer, Josette, was being very entertaining. Uh, Mr. Kubetli, I had a visit from Dr. Haller earlier this evening. It seems his real name is Muller. I know. According to him, you are a Turkish agent acting under Colonel Harkey's orders. That's so? Quite so. Uh... Why didn't you let me know? Because Colonel Haki has a low opinion of your ability to conceal your feelings and consider that if I wish to keep my true identity secret, I had better not tell you of it. Oh, I see. Well, before we go any further, suppose you show me your credentials. Here. Here is a letter from Colonel Haki. Mm-hmm. Quite satisfactory. Good. Now, tell me about murder. What did he say to you? He proposed that I pretend to get typhus when we reach Genoa. He and Mibridopolis. Banner. Yeah, yeah. He and Banner would take me to a clinic where I'd be the only patient and they the only doctors. Mr. Graham, it is very courageous of you to let me know about this. Oh, frankly, I'm telling you as quickly as possible before I lose my nerve and change my mind. It is courageous anyway. Perhaps, but I'm already beginning to regret it. How can I keep these Nazis from killing me now? It is very simple. Colonel Haki anticipated that something like this would happen and he and I hatched a plan. Early tomorrow morning, before dawn, I can leave the ship and get to Genoa on a pilot boat. Why can't I? Because you have no diplomatic passport. I have. By six o'clock, I can be at the Turkish consulate. Will that do any good? If you do your part properly, yes. Now, you have to go to Muller at once and tell him that you agree to his plan. What? It is the best way to keep him quiet. Then, tomorrow morning, sometime after I have left, you have to prepare your baggage, leave it with a note for the steward, and go down to state room number five. That cabin is empty and unlocked. But won't Muller and Banner be looking for me? Yes. But about that time, the ship will be docking and then we have to go ashore and wait. You stay in stateroom number five. I see what you mean. You better, that's marvelous. I stay there until you with your diplomatic passport come aboard and get me. Exactly. I will have policemen with me with drawn guns. And there will be policemen on the dock with drawn guns. <laughs> we'll go down the gangplank and Muller and Banner will stand watching us unable to do anything. That's all right, Mr. Graham. <laughs> Oh, it's you. I wanted to see Dr. Haller. This is his stateroom. Come in and wait for him, Mr. Graham. Oh, thank you. I will, Mr. Banner. Never Daphilus, please. Oh. You're sensitive about the names under which you do your killing. I don't find you very pleasant company, Mr. Graham. That's so. I think you're a charming fellow. You won't think so tomorrow. On the contrary, I'm looking forward to tomorrow. I understand you're going to be one of my medical attendants. Oh, and you've accepted Dr. Haller's plan, huh? Mr. Merler's plan. Yes, I've accepted it. Oh, Mr. Graham. Has Mildredopolis been amusing you? Not much. Graham says he's going to accept your plan, Dr. Haller. Is this correct, Graham? Yes. I'm glad. I'm sorry. Forgive Mildredopolis, Mr. Graham. He has the skill of an expert craftsman, and he's happy only when he is using it. Is that so? He's not so skillful in Istanbul, were you, Pana? Mildredopolis, please. Dr. Haller, have you any instructions for me? Just meet Livrodopoulos and myself on deck tomorrow before we dock. They will tell you what to do then. All right. And you do it too, Graham. All right, Donna. Livrodopoulos, right. please. <laughs> It 
late when I got back from my talk with Mother and Bonner. Juvetti was already asleep, snoring. And I looked at him with great affection. This was the man who would go ashore tomorrow morning and return with policemen to rescue me. I got into bed, and I think I went to sleep with a smile on my face. In the morning... Juvetti had left an alarm clock set for 7.30. He was taking no chances that I would oversleep. I dressed swiftly, whistling a bit. Then I packed my bag, bag, left them with a note for the steward, and proceeded quietly along the deserted corridor to state room number five. Ah. Lying across the floor of state room number five, with its legs under the lower berth, and its head covered with blood, was the body of Mr. Cubert. <laughs> trying to kill me, a German agent. What do you want me to do? I want you to be the first person off this ship, Jose. I want you to go to the Turkish consulate in Genoa. Yes. Ask for the consul and give him a message for me. Can you do that? What's the message? You must remember this. You can't write it down. I'll remember. Inform Colonel Harkey of the Turkish secret police in Istanbul that his agent, Kuvetli, is dead. Okay. No. Yes. No. Yes. Tell Colonel Harkey that I'm forced to accompany German agents Muller and Banner. Traveling with the passports of Dr. Haller and Mibridopoulos. Just one moment, Mr. Gray. Why can you not go into the captain and, and have these men arrest? Because I was a fool, Josette. Because I suspected Mr. Cuvetli and told the person that Cuvetli wanted me killed. Under the circumstances, they would think now that I had killed him. I see. I can take the fact. Is there any more to the matter? Yes, this is the important part. Tell them that if I do not get in touch with them by 7 o'clock tonight, that I cable my employers to send another man by plane to Turkey to do my work over again. You would be all right. You would get in touch. You must. No, Josette. I'll try to escape, and I shall probably fail. I can face a fact, too. Have you a gun? I haven't even a pocket knife. Then wait, wait. Here. Here's my little revolver. Oh, Josette. There are only three bullets. I'm sorry. I can't thank you enough, Josette. They're my enemies, too, Mr. Gray. I am French. Use my gun on them. I hope I won't have to. What do you mean? Well, they're taking me somewhere. I, I don't know where. They say it's Santa Margarita. They say for just six weeks. Can you believe them? I don't know, Josette. It's just a chance that they may be telling the truth. I'll know by the road they take me on. Well, perhaps I'd better leave it to your packing. Just like that? Come here, Josette. Yes. Josette. When shall I see you again? Probably never. Are you taking the four o'clock express for Paris? If I escape... You are taking the 4 o'clock express for Paris. Look for me, Yanni. All right. I am taking the 4 o'clock express for Paris. I shall find you in your compartment, Paris. Goodbye, Joseph. Au revoir. <laughs> All right. Au revoir. Good morning, Mr. Graham. Good morning. What do I call you, Hallow or Muller? Hallow, please. It will be pleasant to get ashore again, won't it, Mr. Graham? I hope so. Are you ready? Quite, but I haven't seen Cubetta this morning. Haven't you? No. I hope Cubetta doesn't spoil our little scheme. I don't think he will, Mr. Graham. You know, Dr. Hallow, if Cubetta tries anything, I, I think you should use force. Oh, I would hate to do that. Ah, Livrodopolis. Ah, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Graham. Good morning, Peter Banner. Never Dopolis, please. As you will. Dr. Haller, what is your plan? We will have to go through customs separately. Liverpolis and I will go first. We shall be waiting for you as you come out, Mr. Graham. I see. And I have a warning for you, Graham. Yeah? We shall be watching you as you come through customs. It will do you no good, Graham, to tell the customs officials about us. No, I wouldn't do that. You had better not. We would shoot you down on the spot. Well, don't worry. I want to get to Santa Margarita alive. You'd like Santa Margarita, Graham. There's a cemetery there, too. Men walk to the gallows. Men walk to the death chamber in the modern prison. 
They walk because they have to. No one willingly directs his steps toward death. That bright sunny morning in Genoa, I stood beside my bags in the customs shed. Stood there while they were examined, and stood motionless there after they'd been completely inspected, and the official had told me that I might go. I never took a step until... Signor Graham, will you kindly move along? You're blocking the way. Very well. Next, please. Ah, Graham. Mm. Hello, Dr. Haller. Hello, Peter Banner. I am glad mm. you have two bags to carry, Graham. It will prevent any attempt at foolishness. I'm here. What do I do now? Fall in between Neurodopolis and myself. Good. Mm. Now, we walk slowly. You see that large American car with the chauffeur in front? Is that going to take us to the hospital? It is going to take us somewhere. Yeah. Let me open the door for you, Graham. No, Mr. Graham. I'll get in first. Now, you, Graham. And now, me. There. You are snug and cozy between Bernard and myself, Mr. Graham. Good. Right on. were closed. I stared at the back of the driver's head, conscious of Banner on my right and Haller on my left. We came to a crossroads. Now I would know. Santa Margarita was off to the right. I braced myself for the turn, when suddenly the car turned to the left. Do not try bumping me again, Graham. I'm sorry, I thought we turned right for Santa Margarita. What gave you the idea, Mr. Graham, that we were going to Santa Margarita? You did. You were not so simple as to believe me, were you? No, but I did have a hope. Well, you shouldn't have. Now, Mr. Graham, I have a request to make. Let me stop when you are asked to get out. Please do so without argument or physical protest. If you cannot consider your own dignity at such a time, please think of the cushions of the car. We left the outskirts of Genoa and took a left fork toward Novi Torimo. I glanced at Haller. He was sitting back with his eyes closed. A man whose work for the day was done. The rest of the day was banner. I could feel the killer's deep-set eyes on me, and I knew that his cruel, thin mouth was grinning. Banner was going to enjoy his work. <laughs> This is as far as you are going, Graham. They will kindly make no fuss, Mr. Graham. I make no fuss. Let us get out, then. Wait here, Court. Doesn't your chauffeur like to watch these things? You are brave to joke at such a time, Mr. Graham. Can't we hurry this along, Haller? I have an appointment in Genoa. Sorry to inconvenience you, Banner. All right, Graham. Stand over there. Near that stump. I take a cigarette? You may start a cigarette, Mr. Graham. I thought you such a revolver full in Banner's face. And even if something horrible happened to that face, Haller's hand moved from his pocket and I shot again. There's only, only the chauffeur left now. The car started along the road once again and I took a wild shot. <laughs> Thank heaven, Joseph's revolver had three bullets in it. How do you do? <laughs> Mademoiselle is asleep. So I see. Are you assigned to this compartment? No, I have a compartment two cars back, but I should like to change with you. <laughs> I don't blame you. I, too, find Mademoiselle beautiful. Perhaps. But, of course, you are very young and won't mind changing with me. Uh, 
Now, to me, you seem very old and won't mind going back to your own compartment. See here, mademoiselle is an old friend of mine. Is that so? I intend that she become an old friend of mine, too. Young man, for the past week, expert troublemakers have been making trouble for me. I scarcely think you could improve on their methods, but perhaps I've learned something from them. I wish to travel in this compartment with Mademoiselle, and I'm going to travel in this compartment with Mademoiselle, even if I have to use the methods of an international thug. You see, here from my pocket, I draw a gun. Uh, don't, don't shoot. Don't tempt me. Here, uh, let, let me get my bag. I'll go, I'll go. You won't regret it. There's a very pretty girl of your own age in my compartment. Compartment F, two cars back. Yes, yes, I'm leading, sir. I'm leading. <laughs> That you've been away. Of course, Monsieur Graham. Sounds very much to me as if you'd flirted with that boy. He was a very nice boy. I have your gun here, Josette. But I think I'll keep it to use on the enemy. The enemy is still looking for you? No, oh, Josette. My enemy is any man who is looking for you. <laughs> He's not going to get you, Josette. I am. <laughs> have been listening to Laurence Olivier and Eric Ambler's Journey into Fear on United States Steel's Hour of Mystery. The opening program in our summer series of 13 famous stories of mystery, intrigue, and adventure. With Mr. Olivier were Mildred Clinton as Josette, Alexander Scurvy as Colonel Hockey, Guy Sorel as Crozetley, Dwight Weist as Dr. Haller, Richard Coogan as Peter Banner, E.A. Kumschmidt as Copacan, Robert Dryden as the purser, and Anthony Kemble Cooper as the young English. Mr. Olivier's current motion picture as producer, director, and star is Shakespeare's Henry V. United States Steel Corporation hopes that you'll be with us next week at the same time when the Hour of Mystery is proud to present... Geraldine Fitzgerald in The Black Angel by Cornell Woodridge. Remember, next week, The Black Angel starring Geraldine Fitzgerald. And remember, too, that when you see the USS label on any product, it means the steel is good. Tonight's adaptation of Eric Ambler's Journey into Fear was written by Robert Senandella. Our composer-conductor is Harold Levy. United States Steel's Hour of Mystery is produced by Edwin Marshall and directed by Kenneth Webb. Your announcer, Norman Brokenshire. Good morning, Mr. Graham. Good morning. What do I call you, Haller or Muller? Haller, please. It will be pleasant to get ashore again, won't it, Mr. Graham? I hope so. Are you ready? Quite, but I haven't seen Cubetta this morning. Haven't you? No. I hope Cubetta doesn't spoil our little scheme. I don't think he will, Mr. Graham. You know, Dr. Haller, if Cubetta tries anything, I, I think you should use force. Oh, I would hate to do that. Ah, Livrodopolis. Ah, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Graham. Good morning, Peter Banner. Never Liverdopolis, please. As you will. Dr. Haller, what is your plan? We will have to go through customs separately. Liverdopolis and I will go first. They shall be waiting for you as you come out, Mr. Graham. I see. And I have a warning for you, Graham. Yeah? They shall be watching you as you come through customs. It will do you no good, Graham, to tell the customs officials about us. No, I wouldn't do that. You had better not. They would shoot you down on the spot. Well, don't worry. I want to get to Santa Margarita alive. You'd like Santa Margarita, Graham. There's a cemetery there, too. Men walk 
to the gallows. Men walk to the death chamber in the modern prison. They walk because they have to. No one willingly directs his steps toward death. That bright sunny morning in Genoa, I stood beside my bags in the customs shed. Stood there while they were examined and stood motionless there after they'd been completely inspected and the official had told me that I might go. I never took a step until... Signor Graham, will you kindly move along? You're blocking the way. Very well. Next, please. Ah, great. Mm-hmm. Hello, Dr. Haller. Hello, Peter Banner. I am glad you have two bags to carry, Graham. It will prevent any attempt at foolishness. I'm here. What do I do now? Fall in between Neurodopolis and myself. Good. Now, we walk slowly. You see that large American car with the chauffeur in front? They're going to take us to the hospital? It is going to take us somewhere. Yeah. Let me open the door for you, Graham. No, Mr. Graham. I'll get in first. Now, you, Graham. And now, me. There. You are snug and cozy between Bernard and myself, Mr. Graham. Good. Drive on. A waiter brought our drinks, and we talked politely after that. It even started a bit. But my mind was elsewhere. I was full of resentment and anger against the men who were waiting to strike me down in the dark. When we had finished our drinks, I excused myself and strode directly to my stateroom. Went in and opened the suitcase. Why that devil? Why that devil is it? The gun Colonel Hockey had given me was gone. Went to Athens this afternoon, Mr. Graham? No, Dr. Allen. I did. Your friend, Mr. Kuvetli, persuaded me. Is that so? Yes. He had never seen Athens. He hired a car. The chauffeur did the guiding. And since Mr. Kuvetli speaks fluent Greek, the whole thing went off quite satisfactorily. You say he speaks Greek? Yet has never been to Athens? Yes. You'd think he would have been, wouldn't you? However, we Excuse have... Excuse me. May I share this table? My name is Mivadopoulos. Oh, of course. I'm Dr. Haller, and this is Mr. Graham. Monsieur Graham. How do you do? I traveled a long way today, from Salonica. That's strange. Oh? What is strange about it, Mr. Graham? It seems to me, Mr. Mivadopoulos, that it's easier to travel from Salonica to Genoa by train. Some people don't like trains, Mr. Graham. And then some people have special missions on ships. Hmm. Perhaps. Dr. Haller... You are a chairman? I am, but I hope, Mr. Liverdopolis, that we will not get into a political argument. Ah, not at all. I like Germany. Germany and Italy. And what do you think about England? I agree with Dr. Haller. I do not like to get into a political argument. Uh, you have business in Genoa, Mr. Liverdopolis? Yes. I understand the thing to see in Genoa is the cemetery. Is that so? Hmm. Why? It's a very large cemetery, very well arranged. And planted with very fine cypresses. Perhaps I shall go there, then. Perhaps you shall, Mr. Mivrodopoulos. Perhaps you shall. Excuse me, Mr. Graham. Uh, I've been noticing the bandage on your hand. You, uh, you had an accident? This is a bullet wound, Mr. Mivrodopoulos. Some dirty little thief took a shot at me in Istanbul. It was either a bad shot or frightened. He missed. A dirty little thief, eh? Hmm. Must look after yourself carefully, Mr. Graham. I'm perfectly well able to do that, Mr. Mibridopoulos. Is that so? Then you're ready to shoot back next time. You carry a pistol? Um, you hesitate, my dear sir. Perhaps you do not carry a pistol. You should. A man in your position must be very, very careful, Mr. Graham. Five thousand. One out of every five are returned servicemen. Those 45,000 jobs are U.S. Steel's way of keeping faith with the men who made our victory possible.
we pause briefly for station identification. You are listening to the Hour of Mystery, sponsored by the industrial family that serves the nation, United States Steel. The curtain rises on the second act of Eric Ambler's story, Journey into Fear, starring Laurence Olivier as David Graham. Did you ever perform a whole series of complex and purposeful movements without realizing what you were doing? I did. After Kivette told me that Peter Banner, the man who had been hired to kill me, was with me on the ship, I pulled on my trousers, put on my socks and shoes, knotted the laces securely, put on my shirt, buttoned it, tied my tie, and put on my jacket. I know I must have done these things because suddenly I realized I was fully dressed. Kivette was still talking to me. But I left the stateroom and went directly to the office of the purser. What do you do? Monsieur Graham, is it? Yes, I want to see the captain at once. For what reason, monsieur? It's absolutely necessary that I be put ashore immediately. Impossible, monsieur Graham. The pilot boat has gone. I know that, but the circumstances are exceptional, and I'm ready to pay for the loss of time and the inconvenience caused. But why? Are you ill? No, but I assure you my reasons are excellent. Uh, perhaps, monsieur... But we do not alter our schedule on the basis of mere assurances. Very well. Since you insist on details, I'll tell you. There's a man on this ship who is here for the express purpose of killing me. Indeed, monsieur. And his name? Peter Banner. There is no one of that name on this ship, monsieur. Uh, he's traveling as Mivrodopoulos. Can you prove Mivrodopoulos is really Banner? Uh, if you radio Colonel Haki of the Turkish secret police at Istanbul, he will confirm what I say. And uh, you think he would recognize the man at that distance, monsieur? Uh, this is no joking matter. I know what I'm talking about. Monsieur, how do you know? Do you know either Mivrodopoulos or Bana personally? No. Well, then, monsieur, you well, That's it. why I hesitated. Mr. Kuvetle told me that Mivrodopoulos is Bana. But then Kuvetle may himself be Bana. In either case, I must be put ashore immediately. Monsieur Graham, you is most education. Is that so? Yes. Uh, have you met the new passenger? No. No, I remained here in the stateroom all day. So? The new passenger came aboard sometime during the afternoon. His name is uh, Mivrodopoulos. Huh? And yet, <laughs> it is strange. What is? Uh, please, I, you must not think me fanciful, Mr. Graham. But I have the feeling I have met Mr. Mivrodopoulos before... And that then, he did not call himself Mivrodopoulos. What did he call himself? Banna. Peter Banna. moment we will return with the second act of Journey into Fear, sponsored by the United States Steel Corporation. And here speaking for United States Steel is George Hicks. Last Thursday, June 6th, was the second anniversary of D-Day, that never-to-be-forgotten June day in 1944, when the United States and Great Britain smashed ashore to speed the final defeat of Germany with the most powerful seaborne invasion ever attempted. I had the high honor of being an eyewitness to that gigantic history-making operation and of describing it over the transatlantic radio to American listeners. Tonight I have the equally high honor of being able to tell you about one man among the tens of thousands who took part in that D-Day operation, one man who is a symbol of the way our armed forces fought to safeguard our American way of living. This one man is Lester H. Bauman. He's 25 years old. He won the Purple Heart when he was wounded on D-Day off the Omaha beachhead there in Normandy. But after eight weeks in the hospital, he returned to the United States and went on to fight the Japs. Now he's back at work at the Cuyahoga Works of the American Steel and Wire Company, where he'd been employed before the war. Today, he's a foreman and happy in his job. 
A good example of the United States Steel Corporation's intensive program to provide worthwhile jobs to returning servicemen. Even while Lester Bauman was fighting, United States Steel was planning ways in which men like Lester, and especially those veterans who are physically handicapped, would again take their places on peacetime production lines. In United States Steel's family of 250,000 workers, some 45,000, one out of every five are returned servicemen. Those 45,000... While I didn't see that man anymore. Finally, my work was done and I was going home. I went to Istanbul where I had to wait one night for a train. I dined with Mr. Kopaikin, our Istanbul representative. And after dinner, invited him to my hotel room for a drink. <laughs> I'm glad you asked me. I can use the drink, Graham. Fine. And then, of course, knowing that you're in your room, I'll be sure you're safe. <laughs> you're rather an old woman about my safety, uh, Kopaikin. Well... A very good man, Graham. No, boss. Here we are. Graham. Wait, wait. Do you hear a noise inside? Of course not. Be careful. Be careful, Graham. I think someone is in your room. I've got into your room. Here, let's go in. No. No, no, Graham. No. Listen to me. You have to open the door, but keep well over to the side. Don't find yourself in the doorway. Go back, old man. You've got a bad case of nerves. Here. Get to the window. Catch him. Oh, oh, oh. No use, Graham. He's gone. Get into the rat. All right. All right. The door. Wait a moment. Wait. Now, well, lucky for me, you did hear that noise in here, the back. Are you all right, Graham? Oh, yes. Stop me in the hand. Thank you very much. Now, come, let me bandage it. Come. Thanks. Here, this, this handkerchief will do. Oh, that's not too nasty. Mm-hmm. I should thank you, Kapakin. You probably saved my life. Well, I uh, said you're a very valuable man, Graham. Does it hurt? Huh? No. Oh, there. No, I think it's all right. I feel fine. I don't think he got away with anything. Oh, I'm sure he didn't. Bags are still locked. There was nothing much. Hey, wait a minute, Kopakin. Why are you sure he didn't get anything? Never mind. You've been hinting mysterious things all evening. Kopakin, did you really hear a sound in here, or did you just know somebody was waiting? Never mind. Maybe I'm imagining things now. At any rate, I'd better telephone the management. No. Why not? I'm afraid they reported to the Istanbul police. What are you talking about? That's just what I want them to do. I want that dirty little thief called. The city police must know nothing of this. Why not? This is a case for the secret police. Secret police? Exactly. Come here. Come. Look out the window. See? The man climbed up a steel framework from the terrace. He could have got to any other room on this floor by the same method. Why did he pick yours? I suppose he had to pick somebody. The lock on your window was forced. It's hot tonight. Almost all the other windows are open. Why would a mere burglar select a window that was locked? Don't ask me why a burglar does anything. It wasn't a burglar. That's why I'm going to call the secret police. Get me his molly, five, three, two. Finally, my work was done and I was going home. I went to Istanbul, where I had to wait one night for a train. I dined with Mr. Kopaikin, our Istanbul representative. And after dinner, invited him to my hotel room for a drink. <laughs> I'm glad you asked me. I can use the drink, Graham. Fine. And then, of course, knowing that you're in your room, i be sure you're safe. <laughs> you're rather an old woman about my safety, uh, Kopaikin. Well, you're a valuable man, Graham. No, boss. Here we are. Mm-hmm. Graham, wait, wait. Do you hear a noise inside? Of course not. Be careful, be careful, Graham. I think someone is in your room. I've got into your room. Here, let's go in. No, 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 Graham, no. Listen to me. You have to open the door, but keep well over to the side. Don't find yourself in the doorway. Go back in, old man. You've got a bad case of nerves. Here. Get to the window. Catch him. Oh, oh, oh. There's no use, Graham. He's gone. Get into the rat. All right. All right. The door. Wait a moment. Wait. Now, well, lucky for me, you did hear that noise in here, Kopakin. Are you all right, Graham? Oh, yes. Stop me in the hand. 
I know. Come, come, let me bandage it. Come. Right. Here, this, this handkerchief will, will do. Oh, that's not too nasty. Mm-hmm. I should thank you, Kapakin. You probably saved my life. Well, I <laughs> said you're a very valuable man, Graham. Does it hurt? Huh? No. Oh, there. No, I think it's all right. That feels fine. I don't think he got away with anything. Oh, I'm sure he didn't. Bags are still locked. There was nothing much. Hey, wait a minute, Kapakin. Why are you sure he didn't get anything? Never mind. You've been hinting mysterious things all evening. Kapakin, did you really hear a sound in here, or did you just know somebody was waiting? Never mind. All right, maybe I'm imagining things now. At any rate, I'd better telephone the management. No. Why not? I'm afraid they reported to the Istanbul police. What are you talking about? That's just what I want them to do. I want that dirty little thief called. The city police must know nothing of this. Why not? This is a case for the secret police. Secret police? Exactly. Come here. Come. Look out the window. See? The man climbed up a steel framework from the terrace. He could have gone to any other room on this floor by the same method. Why did he pick yours? I suppose he had to pick somebody. The lock on your window was forced. It's hot tonight. Almost all the other windows are open. Why would a mere burglar select a window that was locked? Don't ask me why a burglar does anything. It wasn't a burglar. That's why I'm going to call the secret police. Get me his molly. Hi, three, two. Hello. Colonel Hockey, please. Hello. And I slept. It was late in the day when I awoke. As I was dressing, Cubetli returned from his trip to Athens. Well, Mr. Graham, you should have come with me. Athens is most education. That's so? Yes. Uh, have you met the new passenger? No. No, I remained here in the stateroom all day. So? The new passenger came aboard sometime during the afternoon. His name is uh, Mivrodopoulos. Huh? And yet, <laughs> it is strange. What is? Uh, please, I, you must not think me fanciful, Mr. Graham. But I have the feeling I have met Mr. Mivrodopoulos before, and that then he did not call himself Mivrodopoulos. What did he call himself? Banna. Peter Banna. In a moment, we will return with the second act of Journey into Fear. Sponsored by the United States Steel Corporation. And here speaking for United States Steel is George Hicks. Last Thursday, June 6th, was the second anniversary of D-Day. That never-to-be-forgotten June day in 1944, when the United States and Great Britain smashed ashore to speed the final defeat of Germany with the most powerful seaborne invasion ever attempted. I had the high honor of being an eyewitness to that gigantic history-making operation and of describing it over the transatlantic radio to American listeners. Tonight I have the equally high honor of being able to tell you about one man among the tens of thousands who took part in that D-Day operation, one man who is a symbol of the way our armed forces fought to safeguard our American way of living. This one man is Lester H. Bauman. He's 25 years old. He won the Purple Heart when he was wounded on D-Day off the Omaha beachhead there in Normandy. But after eight weeks in the hospital, he returned to the United States and went on to fight the Japs. Now he's back at work at the Cuyahoga Works of the American Steel and Wire Company, where he'd been employed before the war. Today, he's a foreman and happy in his job. A good example of the United States Steel Corporation's intensive program to provide worthwhile jobs to returning servicemen. Even while Lester Bauman was fighting, United States Steel was planning ways in which men like Lester, and especially those veterans who are physically handicapped, would again take their places on peacetime production lines. In United States Steel... If you're quite ready, then we could take a turn about the deck. Why, why of course. Uh, you will excuse us, Mr. Gubetli. Oh, certainly. I will see you later, Mr. Graff. Mr. Graham, you lied to Mr. Kubetli. You made me lie to him. 
I really don't understand. I'm terribly sorry, Dr. Haller, but I simply do not like the man. I, I wanted to be rid of him. He is peculiar. For one thing, he is capable of a lie himself. What do you mean? He said he was a tobacco salesman for Pizarre and Company. There is no such firm. Now, Mr. Graham, about the Sumerian epic. <laughs> Dr. Haller and I took two turns around the deck, and then he retired. I could not bring myself to go to my stateroom, where Cubetli, or was his name, Banner, awaited me. I went to the lounge, but Josette was there. Before she saw me, I backed away and returned to the deck. I walked around and around for hours. The wind rose, and the water lapped against the side of the little vessel. And still, I did not dare return to my stateroom. If I went there and grew tired so that my eyes closed against my will. I might never open them. I paced the deck until nearly dawn. Twice I thought I heard someone behind me, but when I turned, there was no one there. Finally, I went wearily down the companionway and across the corridor to my stateroom door. As I fumbled for my key... Please. Oh, let, let, me, let me use my key, Mr. Grant. <laughs> we both walk all night, eh? I lay for hours listening to the snores of Mr. Cuvetli. The ship docked at Athens, and still I lay there while Cuvetli rose and dressed. I am going to visit Athens today. Uh, please, uh, you will come with me, Mr. Graham? No, thank you. Very well. Goodbye, then. Then I slept. It was late in the day when I awoke. As I was dressing, Cuvetli returned from his trip to Athens. Well, Mr. Graham, you should have come with me. Athens is most education. That's so? Yes. Uh, have you met the new passenger? No. No, I remained here in the stateroom all day. So? The new passenger came aboard sometime during the afternoon. His name is uh, Mivrodopoulos. Huh? And yet, <laughs> it is strange. What is? Uh, please, I, you must not think me fanciful, Mr. Graham. But I have the feeling I have met Mr. Mivrodopoulos before, and that... And went on to fight the Jap. Now he's back at work at the Cuyahoga Works of the American Steel and Wire Company, where he'd been employed before the war. Today, he's a foreman and happy in his job. A good example of the United States Steel Corporation's intensive program to provide worthwhile jobs to returning servicemen. Even while Lester Bauman was fighting... United States Steel was planning ways in which men like Lester, and especially those veterans who are physically handicapped, would again take their places on peacetime production lines. In United States Steel's family of 250,000 workers, some 45,000, one out of every five are returned servicemen. Those 45,000 jobs are U.S. Steel's way of keeping faith with the men who made our victory possible. We pause briefly for station identification. You are listening to the Hour of Mystery, sponsored by the industrial family that serves the nation, United States Steel. The curtain rises on the second act of Eric Ambler's story, Journey into Fear, starring Laurence Olivier as David Graham. Did you ever perform a whole series of complex and purposeful movements without realizing what you were doing? I did. After Cupetti told me that Peter Banner, the man who had been hired to kill me, was with me on the ship, I pulled on my trousers, put on my socks and shoes, knotted the laces securely, put on my shirt, buttoned it, tied my tie, and put on my jacket. I know I must have done these things because suddenly I realized I was fully dressed. 
Givetli was still talking to me. But I left the stateroom and went directly to the office of the purser. What do you do? Monsieur Graham, is it? Yes, I want to see the captain at once. For what reason, monsieur? It's absolutely necessary that I be put ashore immediately. Impossible, monsieur Graham. The pilot boat has gone. I know that, but the circumstances are exceptional, and I'm ready to pay for the loss of time and the inconvenience caused. But why? Are you ill? No, but I assure you my reasons are excellent. Uh, perhaps, monsieur, but we do not alter our schedule on the basis of mere assurances. Very well, since you insist on details, I'll tell you. There's a man on this ship who's here for the protect me, because even if I could recognize Banner, I wouldn't know how to cope with him. I'll need protection only overnight. I'm leaving on the 11 o'clock train tomorrow. No, you're not. My dear sir, I said I'm leaving on the 11 o'clock train tomorrow. No, Mr. Graham, you're leaving on a small cargo ship going to Genoa. Colonel Harkey, no. A train is faster, and I want to leave this country as fast as possible. If you boarded the train, you would be dead before you reached Belgrade. How about a plane? You'd be shot down as soon as you crossed the border. Mr. Graham, if you do not agree to travel on the cargo ship, I shall protect my country and yours by arresting you, issuing an order for your deportation... I'm putting you on board that ship anyhow. I hope I make myself clear. Quite clear. Fine. You see, Mr. Graham, I'll be able to check the list of passengers very carefully. You will probably be very safe on that ship. All right, I, I agree. But now let me tell you something. I'm in danger. I've been shot at. A large number of complete strangers are apparently anxious to kill me. I refuse to be passive, Colonel Harkey. I refuse to stand like a tall and stoop-shouldered target for a gang of cutthroats. You're making the arrangements, I accept that. But I insist on one thing. You've got to give me a gun. I boarded the ship the next afternoon. As I walked up the gangplank, I could feel things. Bullets, knives in my back. I hadn't slept. I hadn't turned the light out all night. And now as I stepped from the gangplank to the deck of that miserable little ship, I felt alone and alert. I was a traveler, embarking on a journey into fear. <laughs> Hello, monsieur. What? Oh, startled me. I didn't mean to frighten you, but we are to travel together. I feel we should know each other. My name is José. Maybe you have seen me dancing at the turquoise. Oh, no, sorry. Your name is David Graham, is it not? How do you know that? Don't you suppose a girl has ways of finding these things out, monsieur Graham? Perhaps, but I'd like to know how. Does it matter? To me, a great deal. Can't you accept me as I am without explanation? At the moment, I'm afraid I can't accept anyone without explanation. You sound mysterious, my friend. I'm not your friend. I hope you will be. How did you find out my name? Did someone tell you? You seem alone, Monsieur Graham. Well, who told you my name? Who was it? Is it a passenger? Monsieur Graham, please. I read the passenger list. You are English. And the only English name on the passenger list is... You can leave the ship and get to Genoa on a pilot boat. Why can't I? Because you have no diplomatic passport. I have. By six o'clock, I can be at the Turkish consulate. Will that do any good? If you do your part properly, yes. Now, you are to go to Muller at once and tell him that you agree to his plan. What? It is the best way to keep, keep him quiet. Then, tomorrow morning, sometime after I have left, you are to prepare your baggage, leave it with a note for the steward, and go down to stateroom number five. That cabin is empty and unlocked. But won't Muller and Banner be looking for me? Yes, but about that time the ship will be docking and then we have to go ashore and wait. You stay in stateroom number five. I see what you mean. Juvetler, that's marvelous. I stay there until you with your diplomatic passport come aboard and get me. Exactly. I will have policemen with me with drawn guns. And there will be policemen on the dock with drawn guns. <laughs> we'll go down the gangplank and Muller and Banner will stand watching us unable to do anything. That's all right, Mr. Graham. <laughs> Oh, it's you. I wanted to see Dr. Haller. This is his stateroom. 
Come in and wait for him, Mr. Graham. Oh, thank you. I will, Mr. Bunner. Nivodopolis, please. Oh. You're sensitive about the names under which you do your killing. I don't find you very pleasant company, Mr. Graham. That's so. I think you're a charming fellow. You won't think so tomorrow. On the contrary, I'm looking forward to tomorrow. I understand you're going to be one of my medical attendants. Oh, and you've accepted Dr. Hallis' plan, huh? Mr. Merler's plan, yes, I've accepted it. Oh, Mr. Graham, has Nivodopolis been amusing you? Not much. Graham says he's going to accept your plan, Dr. Hallis. Is this correct, Graham? Yes. I'm glad. I'm sorry. Forgive Nivodopolis, Mr. Graham. He has the skill of an expert craftsman, and he's happy only that he is using it. Is that so? He was not so skillful in Istanbul, were you, Panna? Nivodopolis, please. Dr. Haller, have you any instructions for me? Just meet Nivodopolis and myself on deck tomorrow before we dock. They will tell you what to do then. All right. And you'll do it too, Graham. All right, Panna. All... Nivodopolis, please. <laughs> late when I got back from my talk with Muller and Bunner. You bet he was already asleep, snoring. And I looked at him with great affection. This was the man who would go ashore tomorrow morning and return with policemen to rescue me. I got into bed, and I think I went to sleep with a smile on my face. In the morning... The vet had left an alarm clock set for 7.30. He was taking no chances that I would oversleep. I dressed swiftly, whistling a bit. So many Americans is itself owned by many Americans. Living up to its responsibilities to all three of these groups, the public, its employees, and its owners, is the major job of the industrial family that serves the nation, United States Steel. The curtain rises on the third act of Eric Ambler's story, Journey into Fear, starring Laurence Olivier as David Graham. stood still with my hands raised above my head and looked down past the barrel of the gun into the calm blue eyes of Dr. Haller. I had suspected everyone on the ship of wanting me dead except Dr. Haller. Here was a boresome German scientist, or so I'd thought. Now I had to adjust my mind to the fact that he was a dangerous spy bent on killing me. For a long time, neither of us spoke. Then... I think, Mr. Graham, that you may sit down now. No, I stand, thank you. Very well. So you are Peter Banner. I thought from the way you talked to Mivrodopolis tonight that you realized he is Banner. Oh, then I wonder if your name happens to be Muller. My goodness, I had no idea you were so well informed. Yes, my name is Muller. And I have business to discuss with you. Business? Yes. I like you, Mr. Graham. And yet I am compelled to be offensive. I must tell you that as things stand at present, you will be dead within a few minutes of your landing at Genoa tomorrow morning. How do you mean, as things stand at present? I mean, there is an alternative. I see. A lesser evil. Oh, scarcely an evil. A pleasant alternative. You see, Mr. Graham, I am lily-livered. I admit it freely. So I would like to settle this matter without bloodshed. So would I. You're something of a humorist, Mr. Graham. Now, the only reason we have been seeking your death is that we are interested in delaying the building of torpedo tubes for the Turkish Navy. Six weeks' delay is all we shall need. And they're going to try to kidnap me for six weeks? I should say not. There would be inquiries. There would be investigation. You might be released. No, my proposition is quite a different one. Well, make it and get out of here. Suppose, Mr. Graham, that the moment you get ashore at Genoa, a mild attack of typhus should develop. You would be taken immediately to a private clinic where you would be the only patient. You would be attended by doctors Muller and Bernard. Your illness would last six weeks. You mean to say you'd let me go after six weeks? Why not? After all, Mr. Graham, you would scarcely dare to tell the truth once you had agreed to this proposition. Is that all you have to say? No. There is one other thing. Has Kuvetli revealed himself to you? Revealed himself to me? I see that he has not. It's a very pretty girl of your own age in my compartment. Compartment F, two cars back. Yes, yes, I'm leading, sir. I'm leading. <laughs> That you've been away. Of course, Monsieur Graham. Sounds very much to me as if you'd flirted with that boy. He was a very nice boy. I have your gun here, Justet. But I think I'll keep it to use on the enemy. 
enemy is still looking for you? No, Joseph. My enemy is any man who is looking for you. <laughs> He's not going to get you, Joseph. I am. have been listening to Lawrence Olivier and Eric Ambler's Journey into Fear on United States Steel's Hour of Mystery, the opening program in our summer series of 13 famous stories of mystery, intrigue, and adventure. With Mr. Olivier were Mildred Clinton as Josette, Alexander Scurvy as Colonel Hockey, Guy Sorrell as Corvetli, Dwight Weist as Dr. Haller, Richard Coogan as Peter Banna, E.A. Kumschmidt as Copacan, Robert Dryden as the purser, and Anthony Kemble Cooper as the young English. Mr. Olivier's current motion picture as producer, director, and star is Shakespeare's Henry V. United States Steel Corporation hopes that you'll be with us next week at the same time when the Hour of Mystery is proud to present... Geraldine Fitzgerald in The Black Angel by Cornell Woodridge. Remember, next week, The Black Angel starring Geraldine Fitzgerald. And remember, too, that when you see the USS label on any product, it means the steel is good. Tonight's adaptation of Eric Ambler's Journey into Fear was written by Robert Senandella. Our composer-conductor is Harold Levy. United States Steel's Hour of Mystery is produced by Edwin Marshall and directed by Kenneth Webb. Your announcer, Norman Brokenshire. <laughs>